pleasure to give this course. So it's a, it's basically uh, my first uh, activity, uh, presential activity since uh, uh, 2020. So it's um, it's really like a new experience to me almost to be given a presential mini course. Okay, so um, the idea, that I, what I want to do, so that, let me talk a little bit about motivation. So our motivation is about non-equilibrium phenomena. Okay, so th those non-equilibrium phenomena is something that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous in, um, in nature. So everywhere you look, uh, you will see uh, some non-equilibrium uh, situation. And um, non-equilibrium situations from a physical point of view are not that well understood. Okay, so uh, this morning we've seen a, in, in, in Christina's talk of an example of a non-equilibrium situation, which is a, the, the, this uh, glass, uh, liquid glass transition. So um, in a glass, you're never actually in equilibrium, although um, in, in the models that Christina was uh, describing, the invariant measure is this product measure, which is very well understood. The system itself does never really gets there in some sense, okay? So um, Christina showed us that, that at any fixed uh, density Q, the convergence to this uh, in, invariant state was exponentially fast, but the secret is on the constant on the exponential there, right? The constant is astronomically large. So it's not really getting there in, uh, in the time scales at which we are interested in. So that's one, one uh, example of an equilibrium situation. There, there are other examples. So here in, the, in this graph, uh, I, I, I put here, I put, I put two, two, two examples. So the, the first one, so that it's a, it's a hurricane profile. Okay, so uh, it's a, it's a two-dimensional slice of a three-dimensional hurricane. And it, it turns out that, that from a, in, a, in a very vague sense, a hurricane is the stationary object, okay? Because what a hurricane is doing is that it's connecting, um, you see there the tropopause, and so it's like the, the beginning of the, of the stratosphere with the sea. So the sea is a heat reservoir, uh, and, and, and this uh, hurricane is like a tube connecting these two guys, okay? But instead of having this picture we have in mind about, for example, uh, a bar connecting uh, cold to, uh, uh, to, to hot uh, and, 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 and heat flowing in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a nice and ordered way from one to the other, what we have is a hurricane. Okay, which is a very uh, not the um, ordered way to connect these two uh, heat reservoirs. And what happens there is that, uh, of course, instead of having an ice tube connecting these two guys, you have a hurricane because a hurricane is more efficient. Okay, so that's the that's something that um, somehow we need to understand that uh, non-equilibrium stationary states. Okay, things that are stationary but not in equilibrium. In a, this is a very vague sense. So a hurricane is clearly not in equilibrium, right? Because okay, it's a hurricane, and um, and these these objects they have this tendency to uh, do the job better than equilibrium stationary states. And this is that those type of things are the things that uh, we would like to understand. Okay, so I, I put here another example of a non-equilibrium stationary state, uh, melting snow. So this is uh, something we experience every day here in uh, Montreal. Um, and the, it, it's, it, it's again, it's not like melting ice, right? So you have ice and then ice melts and it's, it's, it's soft, nice order. You, you get some liquid getting out, heat, et cetera. And then you, you can put an, a, an equation into that, a PDE. So people call it the Stefan problem maybe. Uh, that's just kind of well understood. But here you have snow and snow is different. It's, uh, it's more complicated, okay? So non-equilibrium phenomena are everywhere in, a, in, 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 in the real world and are poorly understood from the point of view, from the mathematical point of view. So. 
Um, so we really want to understand that. And as a mathematician, what you do is that you start to simplify your problem until you get something that you can actually solve, no? And uh, this is our, uh, our aim is to give an approach that somehow makes sense for us as mathematician to this non-equilibrium phenomenon, okay? So we're, we're in this search for, in a sense, robust and dynamic methods, okay? Because uh, something which is more or less clear is that dynamics, dynamical aspects of non-equilibrium phenomena are important. You cannot just uh, describe the stationary states of these guys and get the information you want. You see, uh, we, we already seen in Christina's talk about this, uh, this, this, this kinetically constrained models that the stationary states are extremely simple, just a product of Bernoulli measures. So something which is absolutely well understood from that point of view, but the dynamics, it's a completely different business, okay? So, well, we have these two um, examples. Huh? And uh, so, so let me go for the setup now. Okay, so what do I call a non-equilibrium uh, system, okay? So actually what we are going, what I'm going to call a non-equilibrium system is something uh, very uh, well known for paralysis, a finite state Markov chain. Okay, a finite state Markov chain is what I'm going to call a, somehow a non-equilibrium system. And a non-equilibrium stationary state is the invariant measure of a Markov chain, which is not reversible. That's going to be, that's going to mean for me a non-equilibrium stationary state, okay? So maybe a quick, uh, I don't know, if, I hope people in the online can see this, but this is, I just want to give a quick, uh, there's no shock. What's the shock? Ah, okay, thank you. Okay, so let me just give you uh, um, something, a, a quick uh, description of a non-equilibrium stationary state of a Markov chain. So, so you have a Markov chain, so you, you have these points here. And um, sometimes, because this Markov chain is complicated, you don't know the invariant measure. But to actually show that the invariant measure is not reversible is easy, even if you don't know it, okay? Because what happens is that if you find one loop, okay, one cluster circuit of allowed moves on your Markov chain such that the probabilities, the product of these three probabilities here, for example, is different from the product of these three other probabilities here, then that implies that the invariant measure of your Markov chain is not reversible. Okay, so non-reversibility is kind of easy to see, okay? Um, so those type of situations or the invariant measures of Markov change which are not reversible is what we are going to call non-equilibrium stationary states. And somehow, what, is that a sufficient condition? Uh, let me see. So if this happens, then the, 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 the measure is non-reversible. And if the measure is reversible, it satisfies this condition for two loops. It's called the detailed balance condition, okay? So I don't know if that answers the question of, uh, of Francesco. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. ah, yeah, that's, that's an important remark. So okay. this is supposed to be... Um, uh, just a moment, uh, because uh, uh, some people, uh, Tom, have... Uh, uh, problems to see the blackboard. Indeed, there is a, a line that you can move with the mouse and you can enlarge the, the picture with the, uh, with the blackboard. At home, you have to pin the blackboard video yourself manually if you want to see the blackboard. Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, please no, go. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, okay, so that, that was for the audience. So you can do it manually. You can, uh, you can switch between the, the two setups if you want to see the, the black or larger. Okay. Uh, and okay. So what I was saying is that um, non-equilibrium systems are going to be Markov chains for us. And 
and non-equilibrium stationary states are going to be invariant measures of Markov chains, which are non-reversible. So now we have, a, a, at least we have translated this uh, physical problem into a concrete mathematical problem, which is we want to analyze Markov chains and we want to analyze their invariant measures. Okay? And what I want to do is to try to set up some sort of a strategy that makes sense for any Markov chain in such a way that for your favorite Markov chain, now you have at least a tool, one way to proceed that makes sense. This way to proceed may or may not be convenient for your favorite Markov chain, but at least you have one more tool in your set of tools, okay? So now, now there is one more. So um, the, what is the setup now? So we have a finite state space omega. So, Alice, um, sorry, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> so we have a, a finite state space omega. So here, in order to keep uh, the technical problems to a minimum, I'm always talk, uh, going to talk about finite state Markov chains because uh, then you don't have to worry about infinities and, uh, and convergence and stuff like that, okay? So everything is going to be finite. So everything is going to be well-defined. So I have a finite state Markov chain. Now I'm going to call omega t. So this Markov chain happens at continuous time. And uh, it has to be, I'm going to assume that it's irreducible, although it's not fundamental. Okay, so it might be not irreducible in some situations. And in some meaningful situations, Markov chains are not irreducible. And you can still uh, try to apply this methodology that I, I want to introduce in this miracle. And so I'm going to call L the generator of the Markov chain. Okay, so uh, it's written there. So how do you, uh, how do you read that uh, definition of the generator there? So, okay, Blackboard? Yes, Blackboard. Okay, so let's go to the Blackboard and try to explain you. Um, this is for later. So what does it mean that L is the generator of your Markov chain? Okay, so I'm going to uh, take the advantage of being preceded by uh, Christina and Hendrik, which already uh, uh, talk a little bit about these things here. But uh, so let me show you how this uh, generator thing works. Okay, so you have a Markov chain, so funny state, and what I drew here is the adjacency graph of the Markov chain. Okay, so. Um, here it means that, uh, well, this is like, a, uh, it's a random work. So it's, uh, you can go uh, between neighbors, maybe, or it could be a thing. And then you put numbers here, okay? So you, get, you can put here, uh, so if this is, um, if this guy is sigma and this guy here is omega, here you have a rate sigma omega, and here you have another rate, which is omega sigma, which are different, okay? So what happens is that, um, if you are a sigma, you live to omega with this rate, okay? And if you are omega, you live to sigma with this rate, and maybe here you have sigma prime, and what happens is that you live from omega to sigma prime at a different rate, okay? So those are these numbers that you put on the generator, that's what they mean. And uh, let us remember, if, 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 you, if you don't like continuous time, you just can think about discrete time. In discrete time, these are probabilities, no? So they have to add up to one. Um, and they tell you so that you are here and in the next step, you go either here or here. Uh, so this is not, it's downstairs here is going to be R of omega sigma prime according to my design. So you go from omega to one of these two guys with probabilities which are given by these numbers here, okay? So this is that discrete time Markov chain and those are the numbers R. In continuous time, uh, what happens is that uh, instead of having uh, discrete steps, you have continuous steps that are given by uh, Poisson clocks, okay? And uh, what happens is that at each one of these arrows here, you put an independent Poisson clock that will tell you where, when to jump. And uh, the rights of these uh, Poisson clocks are given by these arrows. If 
you don't like that as well, you can think in, a, in, a, in, a, in another thing, which is that uh, omega t is actually omega of n of t, okay? Where omega of n is a discrete time Markov chain, n is an independent Poisson process, and that gives you your, uh, your continuous time Markov chain, okay? So I hope that uh, you understand what these R's are. So they are just the, the, in the discrete time case are the probabilities at which you jump from, is the probability at which you jump from omega to sigma in that case there. And then, um, and in continuous time is the instantaneous Poissonian rate at which you jump there, okay? And uh, why do we define the, the generator? Because actually the generator is a, is, it's, it's a convenient way to do computations, okay? So let me show you now the computations, okay? So um, what, what I want to do now is that I, 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 all, everything that I, 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 I'm telling you here is kind of elementary, but a little bit non-standard in the sense that it's not what you see usually in a basic core of Markov chains, okay? So it turns out that uh, you can formulate all, you can define, formulate all theory of Markov chains just using martingales, there is a, um, a, it, this is done through what is called the Dinkins formula, okay? So Dinkins formula is what I, I wrote there, is the following. So for any function f, which is a function of your um, configuration of uh, your Markov chain, so it, it could depend on time as well. I put there the dependence on time because uh, in, in, in many situations it's very convenient to take also a, a function that depends on time. And what happens is that uh, if you take that, that process there, define this process mt of f, turns out to be a martingale, okay? And uh, you see that the generator is down there inside this integral. This is just a, it's, it's just a formula that gives you a bunch of martingales out of a Markov chain. Okay, it's called the Dinkin formula. Sometimes Dinkin's formula is called something else, but it's equivalent to this one. And, um, and here, and this is the important thing, this is, this is a sort of change of paradigm by the so-called struck varan and Martingale problem. So struck varan and Martingale problem tells you the following, that a, a Markov chain, or what? A process, omega t is a Markov chain, if and only if all these guys are martingales. Okay? It's maybe a typo. The second omega should be an omega zero. Yeah. Yeah, probably yes. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's correct that. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So, uh, the martingale problem of Struck and Valadan is a different way to look at a Markov chain. Okay? So, I, I'm going to repeat it again because it's, it's, it's an important thing. So a process omega t is a Markov chain if and only if these guys are martingales. Okay, so it's a different characterization of a Markov chain, which means that all information that you can take out of a Markov chain using the, the, the usual methodology that is, 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 uh, uh, is taught, for example, in a, in a basic course of Markov chains, you can also do it with martingale, with martingale theory. Okay, um, so, okay, so here I took um, a random quotation from Google. So I, I, I just uh, uh, put on, on Google Martin a problem I, and took the first nice uh, quotation I, I found, uh, which says, so the Martin Gay problem due to Struck and Valadan provides another way to define a solution of a stochastic differential equation. It is a concept that is unique to stochastic differential equation in the sense that it has no counterpart in the theory of ordinary and partial differential equations, okay? So, well, here you should change a stochastic differential equation by Markov chain, and it's the same thing. So, that, that, that's, that's, that's interesting about martingales, is that martingales don't have a, somehow, um, a counterpart in uh, differential equations. Therefore, are, uh, they have a probabilistic flavor that made them amenable 
two probabilistic computations, although they are an analytical tool. Okay, so this is, that, that, that's the whole thing. So when, 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 when you use these martingale problems, you open the door to combine analysis and probability in an effective way. Maybe you don't want to do that because you are, you're very bad at analysis and really good at probability, and that's perfectly okay. But maybe you are half and a half. You are kind of good in probability and kind of good in analysis, and then you do matching a problem, and, 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 and it looks like you are much smarter than you really are. <laughs> so Milton, sorry, there is a question in the chat okay. concerning Dinkin's formula, uh, which is the set of test functions? Ah, okay. So any, so all. <laughs> it's, it's discrete. Uh, so uh, so it's so it's a, it's, it's a discrete system. So the only condition you need is differentiability in the time variable. Okay, and uh, for the if and only if condition, if you're interested, you are you don't really you don't even need the, the time variable. So so you take just functions, which are uh, constant in time, and you have that these guys are martingales for all these functions, then. Uh, you characterize uh, your macro. So once again, omega is finite, so I can forget about all the technical issues, right? About domains and operator, no. So in particular, L is a matrix, F is a vector, and everything is nice. Okay, so I just wanted to tell you that about this change of paradigm, which is the, the switch from, a, from the usual theory of Markov chains to the theory of Markov chain through the prism of uh, martingales. Okay, so just um, because in a, for people that uh, are more used to stochastic calculus, in, in stochastic calculus, Dinkin's formula is also, it, it's actually uh, referred to this formula that, I, that, that is here, that it says that uh, instead of to, take, uh, talking about uh, processes, you talk about, um, expectations. So the expectation of f at time tau, it's equal to the initial condition plus the expectation of that integral there. And the secret now that tau is a stopping time. So if this is true for any stopping time and for any uh, function f, then you say that um, the, your process satisfies the martingale problem. And uh, there is this all uh, equivalence. No? So a martingale is a martingale if and only if it satisfies the optional stopping theorem for all the stopping theorems, okay? So that's why these two things are equivalent. Um, and, uh, and there is a consequence, okay, which is uh, uh, sometimes very useful because uh, it allows you to compute uh, some uh, expect, non-trivial expectations of, 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 of functions of your process that uh, the derivative of the expectation of, if, uh, of a function of your Markov chain, this is what I usually call an observable. Now that, that comes from, uh, from physics to call it an observable, right? Um, the expectation, if you differentiate the expectation of observable for a Markov chain, what you obtain is the expectation of a function which is just the generator applied to the observable, okay? So if, if there is a time dependence, you have to add uh, a time derivative uh, in your formula, but, but that's that's that, that, that's what it is, and that, and that this formula is very useful in many contexts. So now, okay, so now let me define something which is at first sight very mysterious, and then when you get used to it, you still find it very mysterious, which is called the Carré Duchamp. Okay, so what is Carré Duchamp associated to L? So the, there is actually a family of operators. Okay, so uh, in, in these guys appeared in algebra actually. So you have a linear operator, and then out of this linear operator, you do some, some bracket construction that I don't really understand very well. And then suddenly you get this Cahé Duchamp operator, which is a bilinear operator. Uh, so here is a quadratic operator. Okay, so it's a, instead of being linear, it's quadratic in, in F. So by polarization, you can also define a bilinear operator, no? like a, a gamma of F comma G. And you may imagine that there are also, this, this, this is going to be something like gamma two. There is a gamma three, four, five, et cetera, which are uh, multilinear operators that make sense as well. And, uh, <coughs> And 
in our um, context, we are going to be uh, contented with describing the, the Carré du Champ because it's the only one that we are going to use. Okay, so there is a formula. So there is an explicit formula in terms of the rates of the probabilities of our uh, Markov chain, which is given by that. So from here, you see why it's called somehow the Carré du Champ. Okay, so it, that means it's, 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 it's like the square of the derivative. That's what you have to think about. Okay, and so so the generator is somehow is kind is like the derivative of your function f along the trajectory of your Markov chain. This is kind of what the generator is, and this guy here is the square of that derivative. Okay, so you take the square of the increment you do, and you and you multiply by the probability of seeing actually seeing that increment, and you then you sum over all possible uh, guys. And, and that, that, that gives you this operator car reduction. And, 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 it's a, and it's a function, right? Oh, the comment, it should be the symmetric part of uh, R not uh, R in gamma, isn't it? So um, that's actually another thing is that that's the Dirichlet form. So the Dirichlet form is the integral of this guy with respect to the invariant measure. And when you do that, you lose the, 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 the anti-symmetric part of the, of the guy. But, at, uh, but, but here, it's better to keep it okay, for, uh, for what it's, um, for the computations I'm, 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 I'm going to do. Okay, so that's the, that's the thing. Um, <coughs> and, and, and in our context, it's important not to take symmetric part of anything because we always will have in mind that we want to try to treat non-equilibrium situations, okay? Non-equilibrium stationary states, non-equilibrium systems, which means that uh, we don't really know the invariant measure maybe. Maybe we know the invariant measure, but it's too complicated. We don't want to use that information. So, so we want to really try to develop um, a, a sort of methodology that avoids to look at th those guys because that's too much information for us for the moment, okay? So, this is a proposition. This is something that uh, one can try to prove is that uh, that guy there is a martingale. So we start with the martingale MF of T, which is that this is usually called the Dinkin martingale because of the Dinkin formula. And well, you square it and then you get a sub martingale. And now that you have a sub martingale, you have to take out something to make it into a martingale again. And this something that you take out is exactly that guy there. And th that's what people call the predictable uh, quadratic variation of the martingale, okay? So already, um, so, so Hendrik already gave you um, a definition of the predictable quadratic variation and a comparison that there is another quadratic variation, which is the usual one that, that, that one treats, for example, in Ito's formula, which is uh, the limit of squares and stuff like that. So this is not what we're going to do here because uh, this is not what actually works well what works is to do this predictable thing, okay? So for us, the definition is that it's a, this a predictable quadratic variation is what you need to take out of the square of the martingale to make it into a martingale again. I've been always puzzled about these formulas and I, I always try to find um, a way to understand where these formulas come from. And uh, well, this is the way in, I don't know if this is a really good one, but uh, at least is uh, I like it. Okay, so so it, it makes me a little bit more comfortable with these formulas. So it's about exponential martingales. Okay, so it turns out that um, if you have a function f, you have an observable of your Markov chain. That guy there is a martingale. Okay, and you may or may have not seen that before. So let me let me quickly write something here on the blackboard. So if you have a, let me take a Poisson process, okay? So this is just a Poisson process. The usual Poisson process with rate one, nothing fancy. And then one can construct exponential martingales out of it. So you can take E to the theta N and you have to discover what you have to take out of this guy to make it into a martingale. And what you have to take out, you can check that is e to the theta minus one t. So this guy is a So maybe you, you are more ambitious and now you want to do something like this. So you want to do 
instead of theta, you may want to do the test of t and of t. Okay. And now what you have to take out? Uh, well, what you have to take out is uh, actually, well, it's there, no? Uh, Markov process, uh, the, the, the usual Poisson process is an example of a Markov chain, so you can apply that formula there. So what you have to take out is the integral between zero and t of e to the minus theta s and s times, uh, so this is the time derivative plus the generator. So this guy is a Martingale. And then you can use some computations and you will find the formula. Uh, let me see what is the formula. So you derive and you take the derivative. So it's probably something like, uh, I don't know, but you have to do the computation. But uh, the point is that uh, from a Poisson process, you can compute these martingales. And now you can understand the Markov chain as a bunch of Poisson processes going around in parallel, no? because of this construction about the clocks I mentioned before. So there is one Poisson process at each one of the arrows of the adjacency graph of the Markov chain. And each one of these Poisson processes gives rise to one of these martingales where this theta of t here is actually what? It's zero if the Markov chain is not at the right position and it's one if the Markov chain is at the right position. You can combine all of those guys and get that exponential martingale there, okay? So um, this is just a formula that can, you can try to prove. Uh, because of the, of the comparison with the Poisson process, I found this formula more believable than the, the other ones I gave you, no, especially the, the Carré Duchamp formula. And then what happens is that you can recover the, the martingales I told you before using this exponential martingale. How do you do that? So you, you put a parameter on the function f. You put a theta and you multiply f by a constant theta. And now you have a family of martingales which are parameterized by theta. And you can take the derivative of those martingales. And the derivative is also with respect to theta. It's also martingale. Just because the state space is finite, you can exchange all the exponentials and derivatives that you want. And then when you take the derivative, the first derivative, if you evaluate it at t equals zero, gives you m of t, the Dinkin martingale. And the second derivative gives you the, the one that uh, gives the Carré Duchamp. So this is a way on which you can understand this Carré Duchamp. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's just uh, the second term in a series expansion of martingales. So, if, if you're interested and you have patience, you can take the third derivative and get another martingales with compensators and you are going to discover a gamma three out of it. And you take the fourth derivative, you want to discover gamma four and so on and so forth. So, um, so this is one possible way to see that this Cahé Duchamp is just the, the is, is, is L and gamma are just the first and second terms in a series of operators that appears when you look at martingales of Markov chains. So, okay, so now Fokker-Planck equation, okay? So what is Fokker-Planck equation? Uh, remember, or uh, you learned from a uh, uh, basic course on Markov chains that there is something called the transition probability group. Okay, so there is there this PT of X and Y, which is the, the main object that you use to construct Markov chains um, and, um, and that object satisfies some equations, okay? So the, what people call the forward Kolmogorov equation and the backward Kolmogorov equation. And the, so what is called the, no, so the forward Kolmogorov equation is what we call the Fokker-Planck equation, right? Um, and somehow the forward Kolmogorov equation is the most difficult one because it does not involve the generator of your Markov chain or your uh, transition probability matrix in the discrete case. It involves the joint of that, and that can be complicated. So let's try to uh, uh, to understand that. Okay. So what, 
what is the Fokker Planck equation? Okay, so the first thing that you need to, uh, to, to, to fix is a reference measure. Okay, so you have your space, and usually, depending on the, on, on, on the geometric properties of your space, there is a natural reference measure that uh, you want to take as a base for your computations. For example, uh, in the real line, when you look at the at, at, uh, diffusions on the real line, the natural uh, reference measure is just the Lebesgue measure. The Lebesgue measure is not always a probability measure, but it does not really create a lot of problem. Okay, so well, if, if you're not happy with that, you, you just uh, take a, a, a portion of the Euclidean space, a compact portion of the Euclidean space, then you can define uh, the Lebesgue measure as a probability measure because you can just divide by the total volume. And, that the, and what people do is that they use that as a reference measure because, well, it's, it's, the, it's the one that is the, the nicest one, right? Uh, from the, if, if you really want to take into account the geometric properties of your space, that is the nicest possible measure available. Uh, when you are uh, on the realm of Markov chains, there's not always an obvious choice for reference measure, right? Because there's not always geometry involved. No? Sometimes there is geometry, you know, that, that, that for example, you are looking at the random walk on, on the integer lattice, and there the counting measure maybe is a nice reference measure. Uh, maybe you are um, uh, lucky enough that you can normalize it to, because uh, you're looking at your problem at finite volume or maybe on you know, periodic boundary conditions. But, but um, in general, for general Markov chains, there is no, not a canonical way to do that. So um, let me just fix one of them. So I'm going to say that a measure in omega is a reference measure if it's positive for all points on the state space. Okay. So that's my condition. So there is probably another typo here, very small typo. Oof. No, it's solved. That, so the, the, this is a goal, that's what I'm going to call a reference measure. Okay, so now remember that my, I, I'm calling omega t my Markov chain. So at time t, it has some law, right? And I'm going to call p of t the density of that law with respect to new bar. That is, okay, so when I'm what I'm actually doing is just uh, I'm just uh, defining so PT of omega is just uh, the probability of omega t equals omega divided by uh, new of omega. So here you see I'm divided by new bar of omega. That's why I'm I'm, I'm asking it to be a reference measure. So you may or may not want to in, uh, um, put there uh, the, the, the initial condition just to remind you maybe uh, uh, to, um, to add the initial condition into the notation is something that is necessary in some cases, but that, 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 that's, the, that's the number, no? It's, it's PT is a sequence of functions dependent on T. And then um, the idea is to try to find what is the equation that is satisfied by this PT, okay? And it turns out that um, this equation is what is called the Fokker-Planck equation, and it involves that joint operator. And what is the joint operator? So this is why the joint operator is complicated because the joint operator actually depends on the reference measure you are picking, okay? So that joint, operator is something that uh, satisfies the following. So it satisfies, it satisfies this relation here. So this is how you define the, the, the joint. So it's a, it's, um, it's a little bit annoying because it depends on the reference measure you use. Uh, fortunately enough, since we are wo uh, working here in finite state spaces, so omega is finite, you can actually uh, write this uh, adjoint in an explicit way. So it's right there. Okay. That's the formula. And the, you can see that in particular from this formula, it's not clear that 
L star is going to be a Markovian generator. So it's not going to be a gener the generator of a Markov chain because it's not written in the form of something times the difference of the functions f. Uh, you see, the, 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 you, there's no way to put a difference there in a trivial way. So maybe there are some conditions. So for example, if the measure nu is invariant and reversible with respect to the Markov chain, then this guy here is going to be equal to uh, uh, L just because it satisfies the tail balance. And then you can just combine these two factors to make appear a difference on the function size. So that's one way to, uh, 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 slightly less trivial way to do, to do that is that if the measure new bar is only invariant, then uh, L star is going to be effectively uh, the generator of a Markovian dynamics, which is actually called the reversed process of the original chain. And, the, um, and there, there is an if only if condition. So this L star operator is the generator of a Markov chain, if and only if the, measure, the reference measure mu bar is an invariant measure. Okay. So um, that's the definition of that joint. And we have Fokker Planck equation. Okay. So Fokker is the generator. So Francis was sure. asking something that I couldn't catch. So if you could tell me, Alessandra, please, what his. Uh... So the question is Is the generator L or L star open on the right in the formula on the blackboard? Open, open. What does it mean? Open? What do you mean open, uh, Francesco? Uh... Ah, maybe, uh, so can you type, uh, if you cannot uh, speak, uh, can you type, uh, can you explain, please, uh, uh, the question? Yeah, sorry, can you, can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, no, sorry, uh, I, I made a mess in the chat, I think I was, uh, <laughs> I was chatting directly with, uh, with Luigi, sorry. Um, I, I meant whether it applies on both G and reference measure, or F Ah, okay, yes, measure. I understand, so you mean this? Yeah, okay, so it means that it only applies on G and F this way, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so, okay, here I wrote this observation I was telling you before. So L star is a generator if and only if new bar is invariant measure. And L is equal to L star if and only if new is invariant and reversible. So in the, in the situations we have in mind, so, so we don't really want to take reversible Markov chains for the moment, I mean, because, um, because that's kind of equilibrium Markov chains in some sense. Or maybe you can take uh, uh, anyways uh, equilibrium Markov chains, but uh, it's, not, it's not something we want to exploit, okay? So this is just to tell you that um, in many situations, the operator L star is not going to be a Markov generator. That means that the Fokker-Planck equation is not super nice. Because um, if you were a guy from PDE, I will tell you, uh, I, 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 I tell you the problem with the Fokker-Planck equation is that the L star does not satisfy the maximum principle. So that, uh, that's, the, that's the, the key uh, observation in, in PDEs. That means that the solution of this equation is not super nice because without maximum principle, out of the maximum principle, people in PDEs then can get a lot of nice properties for solutions. And here you don't have maximum principle, it means that it's complicated. Okay. But anyways, it's this this uh, this uh, Fokker Planck equation allows you to do uh, computations. Okay. So now let me enter into the main thing. You know, so so the, the course is called Entropy Methods in Markov Chain. So it, it's pretty much likely that uh, entropy is going to play uh, an important role. And actually, the, the important role here is uh, relative entropy. Okay. So um, what is relative entropy? So it's a, it's, it's a way to measure how different are two probability measures, OK? So it's just another way to measure the distance between probability measures. And um, at first glance, it's, it's very strange to do it in this way because this, this the relative entropy is not even a distance, okay? So if you want to measure the distance between two objects, 
the least you can do is to measure it with the distance, no? And then you say, no, relative entropy. Well, there must be a reason for that. And the, 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 uh, and the reason is that uh, relative entropy really works. Okay, so at some point, these guys in the, in the 19th century, Boltzmann and uh, Maxwell and people uh, and, and physicists decided that looking at entropy was a good idea. And it's, well, it was a good idea. Okay. Uh, so let's go to the definition. Okay. So how do you find it? It's, it's just the formula there. So it's, it's the integral of f log f, where f is the density between these two uh, probability measures. Okay. So um, here, for simplicity, I'm assuming that uh, mu is absolutely with genus with respect to mu. And then in that case, this is number is uh, the density is well defined. And then you can compute this integral, which is finite because our Remember that omega is finite, so, so everything is well defined. Uh, so you usually uh, define the relative entropy equal to plus infinity if this uh, absolute continuity condition is not satisfied, uh, because it, well, it, it is what makes sense in this. Uh, in this theory makes this uh, the relative entropy somehow continuous with respect to the extended topology. Where infinity is uh, an extra point on the on the zero infinity line, and this is what we call the relative entropy between uh, it's the relative entropy of mu with respect to mu. So it's not between because it's not commutative. Okay, so I'm, I would say between, but it's, I'm wrong because it's not something commutative. Uh, so it, it is not a it's not a distance. It does not satisfy. It's not even symmetric, so it, it couldn't be a distance. It does not satisfy also the triangle inequality, so not a distance at all. But at least uh, uh, it it does satisfy something, no? So it satisfy pinch scales inequality. Okay, so pinch scale inequality tells you that you can estimate the total variation distance between two probability measures in terms of the relative entropy. Okay, so this uh, well. This, the total variation distance is just one half of the L1 norm, okay? The L1 distance between these two guys. And <coughs> of course, there are reasons why we define it like that. It's a, it's, it's, it's a very meaningful uh, definition from a probabilistic point of view, and it has to have the one half. That makes it even nicer. And, the, and, and you have this inequality. So if you are somehow, if you want to know whether two measures are close or not, one possible way to do is to prove that the relative entropy is small. If the relative entropy is small, then the total variation is small, which means that the, the measures are close in a very meaningful sense. Okay, so um, the reverse inequality is not true. So it's not true that the, if two measures are close in total variation, then the relative entropy is small. Okay, so you can you can cook up examples. There are some logs involved uh, but um, in general is not true okay so if you know something a little bit more about your message and you can get reverse inequalities but i don't find it particularly illuminating so i don't think it's uh, worth to discuss the reverse inequality okay so well something i forgot to say okay of course this is a mini course it's, it's for students so in principle, students should make questions if they, they have any. Okay, so I will make a small pause to see uh, whether you have questions about what we are talking here. You want to ask uh, clarifications or something. Uh, something I didn't tell, but you may I figure it out is that uh, on the website, I, uh, I put the slides of the, of the talk of today. So uh, you can uh, take a Take a look at them uh, if you are if you are missing something if you if, if you want to catch up with some definition etc. Um, okay, so another properties of uh, of relative entropy. So relative entropy satisfies a, a duality uh, definition. Okay, so or, or some variational definition if you want to. So it can be written as a, as a variational formula. Okay, so it's the supremum. Over functions f of that quantity there. Okay, so um, if you are familiar with Legendre transforms, uh, you can check more or less easily 
that uh, this is indeed the case, no? starting from the formula f log f. So f log f has a legend transform, then you can write it as a supremum of something. And if you do that, you end up with this uh, formula here. Okay, so, so it's not a, a big mystery, but uh, in, in somehow in, in, in analysis and in, in let's say an, an analytical approach to probability is always good to have variational formulas because they give you meaningful information about different things. So in one hand, they give you one concrete way to estimate things and also gives you a concrete way to take information out of your estimates, okay? For example, here, let's say that you know that your entropy is small for some reason. So you know that the relative entropy between new and mu is small, and you also happen to know the measure mu very well. So the measure mu is something that you don't really know, for it could be, for example, the law of your Markov chain at time t, and the measure mu could be the invariant measure, for example. And then you know that these guys are close in relative entropy, and then you want to take information out of that. And a variational formula allows you to do that because, of course, if h is the supremum of that quantity there over all functions f, it means that for, for every function f, what is inside the supremum is smaller than the entropy. Okay? And so that tells you that the integral of f d mu is less or equal than the entropy plus the log of the integral of e to the f. Okay, so that gives rise to the entropy inequality. What is, is what is, I wrote down there to get to that uh, to that uh, inequality. What you actually do here is that you put a gamma here, no? And if you put a gamma here, you get a gamma here. And that's it. No? And uh, it turns out that um, this form of this entropy inequality is very useful because in many situations you can really uh, tune the gamma in a, in a proper way to get uh, the estimates you want. And these gammas that you tune make sense in, in, in many situations. Okay, so this is why it, it can be good to estimate the relative entropy between two different probability measures, okay? You see, maybe computing this integral here, no? Uh, with respect to mu is much easier than to compute it with respect to new, because for example, new, you know mu and you don't know new. So that could be a, a good way. But if you want to do that, then you need to estimate the entropy. So you want to estimate this relative entropy in some way. Okay, so what can you do? Now we enter into the, the kickstart of our, uh, of our approach, which is uh, it's the so-called Yaus inequality, okay? So what is Yaus inequality? So the, the, propos the, the, the proposal is the following. You have a complicated Markov chain, okay? And you want to prove something about this Markov chain, okay? So like, for example, uh, some meaningful Lochner numbers, some meaningful central limit theorem, and something you may or may not uh, accomplish is to, to say, there is another, fam there is a family of measures, mu t, in this case, I'm going to call it mu t, which for some reason, I have the impression that could be close to the law of my, ch of, of my Markov chain at time t, okay? Because of, uh, for example, when you are looking at a large scale limit, because you're looking at a perturbation of a known object, there could be some reasons for that because, well, you did some computations and you can, you can, you can guess the limit of your Markov chain and you want to, you want to probe that guessing in some way. So what you do, one way uh, uh, to do that is uh, to, so, so your, your answer somehow, your, uh, your try is going to be this uh, reference measures mu t, okay? Then the, the idea is to compare 
the relative entropy between the law of your process, law of your Markov chain at time t, and the reference measure mu t. But the reference measure mu t moves with t. So um, there's going to be some interplay there. Okay. And that thing there is accomplished by what is called the Jaws inequality. Okay. So let me explain you the elements of this uh, Jaws inequality, how the, this Jaws inequality works. So um, let me call FT. So I need some definitions. FT is going to be the density of the law of omega t with respect to the measure mu t. So notice that uh, this is important that um, in this uh, setting, the reference measure changes with time. So now I'm going to call L star of t the joint of L with respect to mu t. Let's just remember that the, the joint operator depends on the reference measure you're using. So here, when you take the adjoint of the generator L, you get something that depends on t because the reference measure depends on t. So I'm going to call it L of t, L of t star, okay? And I'm going to call H of t the relative entropy of F of t, okay? Or which is the same thing as saying it's the relative entropy of the law of the process at time t with respect to the measure mu t, okay? So it's given by that formula there, okay? So um, the idea now is if for some reason we manage to find a family of reference measure mu t such that the relative entropy is small, and computations are kind of easy in some way with respect to the measure mu t, then we're in good shape to say something meaningful about our original Markov chain omega t. Mm -hmm. And what is nice about the Yaw's inequality is that, that puts that intuition into a um, concrete ground. Okay, so this is my uh, Yaw's inequality. So um, the derivative of the relative entropy is smaller or equal than minus the integral of the Carré Duchamp uh, uh, evaluated at the square root of Ft. So that's something that came out of from the computations plus another thing. Okay, so Ft, Ft, d mu t, where Ft is given by this formula there. Okay, so let's just analyze a little bit this formula here. Okay, um, so for a moment, let us imagine that, um, let us take the case on which the invariant measure, the, the reference measure mu t does not depend on time. So it's, it's a fixed measure mu. Okay, so there is no time dependence on the reference measure. Let's see what, so let's imagine that uh, mu t is equal to mu does not depend on t, okay? If this is the case, then this function f of t is just equal to L star of one. One here, means the constant function equal to one, okay? And uh, what do we know about L star of one? So remember that I told you, L star is the generator of a Markov chain, if and only if the measure mu is invariant, okay? So if the measure mu is invariant, is, is the invariant measure of the Markov chain, then L star of one is identically equal to zero because L star is a generator. Right, so this difference that appears in the definition of the generator gives you zero. So f of uh, sigma minus f of omega is equal to zero for any sigma and omega. Therefore, you don't have plus term; you have anything there. So you get that h prime is less or equal than minus that guy there, which is something negative. Okay, this is the so and and uh, so so we recover something which probably you heard about many times, which is that uh, relative entropy is increasing in time. Uh, sorry, decreasing in time. Yeah, it always depends on the sign that you use to define the thing, no? Uh, but it's truly monotone. So it, it's, a, it, it's a decreasing in time. So you, you really go, the, so, so entropy is one way to measure how you go to the, uh, to the, to the stationary measure, to the invariant measure of a Markov chain. 
So we recover that very well known fact. Okay, so, and moreover, we have some information about how this syndicates, no? So uh, this, the, that guy there, the, the, this integral of, uh, so this gamma square root of FT is what people sometimes call the Fisher information, no? So the derivative of the relative entropy is minus the Fisher information. And in, uh, of course, this is, will be very well known for people that works in, a, in the fusion uh, in, a, in a stochastic calculus, they, they, they do that a lot. In, 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 in the realm of Markov chains, it's a little bit less known, but uh, still a kind of standard. So decreases, the, the, the entropy decreases in time. And, 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 and here, there, there are some variational uh, approach to equilibrium that goes by the name of log sovereign inequalities that you can use to show how fast your chain Converge to the stationary state. Once you get here, in the case of uh, this, this, this is always remember. I, I, for the moment, I'm talking about the case on which the measure mu t, this reference measure, is constant in time and is the invariant measure. And then, um, so we recover that. So so the, so, so this Jaws inequality looks uh, at least in that sense looks to point in the right direction. If the measure mu, like, still let's think about this case here where the measure mu t does not depend on t. If the measure mu is not invariant measure, this number there h of t cannot go to zero because after a long time t, you are very close to the invariant measure. So the h t has to converge to what? To the relative entropy between the invariant measure and the reference measure, which is different from zero because they are not the same. Okay, so um, then it is good that you have plus something there, right? Because that, that, uh, that really takes into account that fact that in, in this formula, the, the, the measure mu t is not necessarily the invariant measure. So, um, so that is, uh, sometimes uh, uh, so this is something that uh, I think. Uh, I don't remember, it was Christina, was Hendrik that mentioned that uh, uh, today, or maybe both, this thing about the energy entropy competition. And so, so I like to see this uh, formula here, like uh, as energy and uh, entropy competition. So it's a, uh, is that, uh, so, so the, the, the first term, the efficient information uh, is, it's akin to, uh, to an energy. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's negative, it pushes in the right direction. And the second term is akin to, a, to, a, to, a, to, a, to an entropy. So it, it, it pushes you away of the, of the region of, uh, of uh, lower energy somehow. And um, so, so what is really, really, really nice about this Joust inequality is that the function f is explicitly computable in the sense that here we have the freedom to choose mu t as we wish. Okay, so in particular, we can choose nice measures mu t for some reason. Okay. If you are in, a, in the realm of interacting particle system, maybe you take product measures because product measures are nice. Maybe they, are, they don't work, they, they are not the right ones, but at least they're nice. So if, they, if, if these measures are nice, it means that we can do the computation. So we can compute L star. We can compute L star of one. We can compute this derivative, extra derivative. So there, there has to be some time derivative because the measure mu does, can depend on time, right? So it makes a lot of sense, all of that. So, so, so this, in these aspects, Jaws inequality is a really nice inequality because the function ft is explicitly computable if you are put it as an input measures mu t, which are also explicitly computable. Uh, and, and this is, is there any relation between mu t and bar nu? Okay, so that is actually a very good question. So in this formula, bar nu has no importance at all in the sense that the function ft does not depend on bar nu. Okay, so what, what's going to happen is that, uh, so if you, if, if you take another reference measure nu tilde, 
this, this uh, Radon-Nicodin derivative that appears in the time derivative is going to be multiplied by an, an extra Radon-Nicodin derivative. You take the log, then you have sums. And one of the sums, this, uh, the, the, the Radon-Nicodin derivative between the new reference measure and the old reference measure has time derivative zero. Okay, so and, uh, that, in that part, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. In the, in, in, in the other guy, so L star T of one actually does not depend on, on new bar. Okay, so new bar is just an, uh, it, it's a sort of artifice to make uh, the, 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 the function FT computable. Right, because in many situations, what, you, what is easy to do is to say, for example, let's take diffusion on the real line. So what I'm going to do, how I'm going to describe the measure mu t? I'm going to, I'm going to give you its density with respect to the Leibniz measure. That's a very reasonable way to define a family of reference measures. So this is, going to, this is what I, 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 I want to do and act. Uh, and afterwards, when you do all the computations and you go uh, and you compute the function ft, you discover that it didn't really depend on the fact that you put the big measure there. You could have put something else. But if you put something else, the, co the computations are harder. And, and, and the end canceled out, so it didn't really matter. So that's that's the role of the of the measure new new bar. Okay, so that answers your question. Okay, so this is about the Joe's inequality, so it's, it's, it's a really nice inequality. Some remarks, so uh, this is just by basically a little bit of repetition of what I, I just told you, is that, uh, so, okay, so there's another question by Francesco. Let me see what Francesco is saying. Uh, so when it is physically interesting to consider a family of reference measures depending on time, do you have a concrete example? I do have a concrete example, and in fact, I have various concrete examples, but, um, so, so let me tell you the following. So let me, let me think on a very, very quick example. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think you have to wait, Francesco, until I do the examples because I'm going to give examples of, of that and uh, in the corresponding context, it's going to be very clear that, that they are physically relevant. Okay, so we can see that, uh, so I was telling, uh, so entropy is decreasing. A little bit of uh, repetition, what I was saying is so the, when, when, when you take as a, as, as, as a reference measure the, the, um, the invariant measure of your Markov chain, you get into the realm of uh, lots of LF inequalities. Okay, so there is a very nice uh, survey paper by the Iaconis and Salof Coste in Annals of Probability of uh, 96, on which they explain all of this. Okay, so it's a very nice paper because they explain very well why, uh, uh, how you can use lots of LF inequalities to get uh, estimates on the convergence to the stationary state of uh, finite state Markov chains in their case, but for uh, between finite state and continuous state Markov chains, when you look at that large scale limits, there's no difference basically because uh, you know there's uh, there's the CLT for the Poisson process relating both, and then it's, it's the same thing basically. So um, so there in, in this paper you can get a lot more information and and and, and also pointers to the right references. You no. Know? Uh, there are lots of names here, uh, scattered name. I can give you uh, Bakri Emery, Ledoux, uh, uh, Laurent Miclo, et cetera. There are, there are many guys that, that are having proved lots and lots, lots of stuff about convergence to stationary states using these uh, log solid inequalities or, or this type of ideas. So we go by, in, 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 in a whole different community, they go by uh, uh, Fisher information, Inequalities, variation inequalities, etc. Okay, so and um, and a, a very interesting remark is that uh, this function f t is equal to zero for every t. So now we are taking mu t, which depends on time. If and only if this measure, that this family is mu t satisfies Fokker Planck equation. So Cedric is asking something. Can you share the right side? So what is special with the log exponential duality using the entropy definition? Why other convex conjugate pairs are not so interesting here? So this is actually a very good question. Um, the answer is completely unclear to me. So as an exercise, this is something you can do. Uh, you, can, uh, you can take, 
So you can define maybe I of T equals to the integral of uh, F of T minus one square D mu T. And then you get a, a completely equivalent. Uh, so so you, you can cook up the, the inequality in that case, you will get something like this. So it's minus maybe twice gamma of F of T plus something. Uh, and here in the something, you will see, uh, so, so this is what happens when you take um, this thing here. And this is very natural to take, no? Del two norm, because it's always good to take the L2 norm because uh, we, we all know that uh, there is some magic about the, uh, the, the, the L2 norm, no? the variance. So, so this is magical thing about the variance that works so well. Um, so you look at that here and you get this inequality here. And what is the point here is that uh, in, in uh, so let me go back to uh, Joe's inequality. In Joe's inequality, in the, in, 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 the, in the error term, so in this term here, you get your function, your error function big F integrated again F of T. And then you have this entropy inequality that allows you to bound that by the entropy. In the L2 case, you don't get that because you get the, L, the, the FT, FT square here. So you cannot bound that guy by something times the, 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 uh, this guy here again. Uh, you don't have room. You will have to use here a, a, a crude a L infinity bound. So you try to do this for various different of convex functions. And maybe you're more clever than me. I try to do that. And the only one that gives you room is the entropy. It gives you log of room, but log of room is a lot more than no room at all. It's really a lot more. Uh, okay, so Cedric is, uh, is satisfied. Okay, that's good. And uh, so maybe uh, in, in, in some situations, maybe you have additional estimates that allows you to make better estimates. Okay, so the, this is uh, so 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 in PDEs, the people do that. They they get a priori bounds from other methods, and because of that, they can use better uh, feature information. So you can use better bounds, uh, better norms here. Okay, so. Um, Ah, okay, so this is the end of my, uh, of, of my uh, slide. So what did I say? Ah, yeah, Blackboard. Blackboard. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, so, so I, I was just about to, to, to so, so now I was, I was just about to do this very same computation that Cedric told me, so that, that's good because I, I really did it. So um, I, I'm, I have still like nine minutes left. So I think I'm gonna stop here for the moment because, uh, well, uh, I don't know you, but I think it's also three, one hour and a half uh, mini courses, it's a, it's a lot. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, so what I, going, what I want to do now is to make a, a poll, okay? Because, I, so the, the, the slides for tomorrow, as you see, are not written yet. So this is the, the, the first yeah. slide for tomorrow. <laughs> so I, I haven't even formatted into, into the right format, no? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, starting from tomorrow, I'm going to do, I, I'm going to focus on one particular example to tell you how these, uh, these ideas work. So today I wanted, I really wanted to give you this, I, I know it was, it, it, it was um, fast, but everything I just told you is completely elementary in the sense that there is nothing fancy. All that you need to do here to, to present a sample, to, if you want to prove uh, Joe's inequality for by, uh, on your own, uh, well, there are some tricks that you need to know, but uh, there, is, it, it's, it's, there is nothing difficult about it. It's just a, a, a very long exercise in calculus one. Uh, so you have, to, you have to use Fokker Planck to take some derivatives, and then you arrange terms, uh, do the usual tricks, and at, at the end of the day, you get the, this, uh, this, this estimate. And, the, and so, the, so the audience is very heterogeneous. So we have students from many places of the world. So I really want to ask you guys, 
what would you prefer for tomorrow? Okay. So let me tell you what is on the menu for tomorrow. Okay. So what? So for tomorrow, I have uh, so or, I mean not for tomorrow, but for the rest of the week. Also, so the idea is that to focus on one particular example and try to develop it as far as possible. So we have three options, okay? Option one, a Curie-Weiss model. So in Curie-Weiss model, there are no PDEs, okay? Well, actually some PDEs, <laughs> little, okay? So option two is a reaction diffusion model. So this guy has some SPDs, okay, but not that much. And the second one is a so-called boundary driven. And this guy here has more SPDs, okay? So, the, so there are these three examples that they, so the, the, the idea is that the, the first one, keeps uh, technicalities to a uh, bare minimum. So it's basically, so you were already introduced to Curie-Weiss model because it's exactly what um, Hendrik explained today. So it would be like a, a more extended version of what uh, Hendrik did today, more, more detailed. Uh, so the second one, it's, um, so if, if, I, I don't know if you, probably you were here, I, I gave a seminar a few weeks ago about the, this reaction diffusion model here at, uh, uh, here at the CRM. Um, so so the, 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 the main idea is that we want, to, we want to understand the scaling limits. And uh, as you've seen in, in, in Cedric's talk, uh, when you look at the Curie-Weiss model, what you, what you obtain in, in, uh, in, in, in the right scale is, uh, is a stochastic differential equation. And you have to analyze this stochastic differential equation in some way. Uh, if, you, if you look at the reaction diffusion model, so the, the reaction diffusion model, now, now there is a space, okay? But uh, um, there is a PDE, but the point is that the, the stationary state of, the, of that PDE is constant in space. So you, using that the stationary state of the PDE is constant in space, you can get rid of the spatial dependence somehow. So, this is still a, a, a model where space plays a role, but um, many of the technicalities can be uh, hidden by the fact that uh, the stationary state, is, uh, it has to be translation invariant. And then boundary driven exclusion process, it's uh, so, so you heard that I think about uh, maybe, maybe you know the exclusion process is, uh, well, if you don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, I just tell you all, uh, very quickly. So it's a it's 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 a model for this this heat transfer between two heat baths that I was mentioned before. So you have more than here heat means density of particles. You have more density of particles on one side of an interval of discrete interval, less particles on the other side, and particles can enter and they move inside doing some sort of random work with the interaction. Uh, in that case, the st the the stationary profile. Of, an, of the uh, associated differential, uh, partial differential equation is not constant in space. So there, there uh, you have to go to the full uh, strength of the theory we're uh, trying to develop. So, so those are the, the options for tomorrow. And uh, so... So, for, uh, so uh, for people online, there is the possibility to vote. So C for Curie bias, uh, type R for reaction diffusion models, a type E if you prefer boundary driven exclusion processes. Okay, we can see also for people uh, in the room. So uh, we, we can count the people here. So who is uh, for uh, uh, the Curie Vice model? One okay, Curie Vice. So uh, who is uh, in favor uh, of uh, the reaction diffusion model? Very good. Okay, and uh, uh, who is in favor of uh, the boundary-driven exclusion processes? 
Okay, you can vote the OSHA twice, probably, I see. <laughs> okay. Okay, it seems wait. to me the majority here is, uh, um, prefers the reaction diffusion model, and uh, maybe Luigi can um, update us uh, about yeah. the online. Uh, so, well, it's 10 for reaction diffusion, uh, six, uh, five for uh, 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 three ways and four for. Uh, sorry, 10 for um, the boundary and exclusion processes, and then about five each for the number of one. Okay, that's that's good. Uh, so, well, the, uh, of, of course, the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so how is, is that called? It's, it's a, mm, how, how is the name? How do you call it? It's a, it's a non vinculant uh, plebiscite, no? <laughs> so, how you call that in English? I don't know. This 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 uh, this uh, plebiscite that you do, uh, where the result is not really uh, yeah. non-binding. Non-binding. Yeah, yeah. So so that's good about the non-binding election. So so we can just take a decision informed by the. <laughs> Anyway, okay. the purified model uh, uh, seems to okay. We can exclude it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the last one. So, so I think uh, okay. So I think two. I'm going to go to for this one. Okay, because um, I think it's uh, uh, anyway. It's, it's it's good to to try to keep the uh, technicalities uh, mm. not uh, at a reasonable level. So so that's the that's on the menu for tomorrow. Uh, so, well, thank you very much uh, no. for your attention. Okay. Thank you.